We are um, in the wrapping up stages of our um, series on witnesses of the resurrection. And for me, this series has been important because we've been trying to see the different people that saw Jesus Christ risen from the dead. And there's incredible power there and, and evidence for us that God really does exist because of what all these different people experienced when they saw Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Whoops. Thank you for spinning. When Jesus died on the cross, do you remember how the disciples felt? They're broken, they're discouraged, they're even some of like Peter and, uh, and Judas, they're ashamed. And all of them are kind of afraid. You find them uh, throughout that, that first week. Even after they've been hearing that Jesus is risen, even after some of them have seen him risen, they're still behind locked doors. They're afraid because they're afraid the same thing's going to happen to them that happened to Jesus. You know, the master's just been crucified. Now it's going to be their turn next. And, and in fact, uh, that's actually what the, uh, the leaders will want. And ultimately, every one of the disciples will die for Jesus. Uh, even, um, and, and most of them will die a really horrible death. Uh, John's the only one who seems to live to old age, but he's uh, put out on this terrible little island called Patmos where he um, is supposed to somehow live out his life for, for God. Forty days later, though, something dramatic has changed. For 40 days after the crucifixion of Jesus, three days later, remember, he rises from the dead. The women find the tomb empty. The angel appears to them. Peter and John run to the tomb, find it empty. Um, Jesus will reveal himself to some of the disciples at one sitting, then another sitting. He's actually going to eat with them on more than one occasion. He's suddenly going to appear out of nowhere inside the room, a room that's locked and, and walled in. He's going to do that on more than one occasion. He's going to appear by a lake. He's going to have breakfast already ready for them. How did he do that? I mean, there's all kinds of crazy things that happen during those 40 days. In one time, he actually appears to over. 500 people all at the same time. Can you imagine having a 500 people having a hallucination? I mean, even if they all had the same drug, they're going to see something different, right? <laughs> and yet, 500 people at one time saw him alive, touched him, spoke with him. Just had to be crazy times, this 40 days. At the end of the 40 days, Jesus takes them out to, to a mountain and says, okay, it's time for me to leave. And by this point in time now, these guys are dramatically changed already, even before the Holy Spirit has come. In fact, the Holy Spirit's not coming for 10 more days. Pentecost, as, excuse me, as we refer to it. These guys are broken, they're discouraged, they're ashamed, they're afraid. In fact, John says, Be, rather you are filled with grief because I have said these things. So with you now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. That's a prophecy Jesus is making that's gonna change dramatically because of his resurrection and because of his ascension. These guys become what? Suddenly, broken, discouraged, ashamed, and afraid, and what do they become? Hopeful, confident, energized, and brave. Luke 24 says, he told them this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Incidentally, Luke ends his gospel with this story of the ascension, the preparation for the ascension of Jesus, and then he begins his next book, you know the next book? The Acts of the Apostles. He begins Acts again with the story of the ascension. The ascension is a much bigger deal than probably many of us understand. Continuing in Luke 24, verse 50, when he had let them, led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. There's the prophecy fulfilled. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. 
What happened when Jesus ascended into heaven? He, first off, he blesses them. He's standing out there at Bethany, which is only about four to six miles away from Jerusalem, and on a little hill, and he's taking them out. He says, okay, here's where we're going to meet. They go up to the top of that hill. He says, okay, guys, it's time for me to say goodbye. I'm heading out of here, but, but let me bless you. It's kind of like what Jason and David did for Mike and, and, and for Russ a few moments ago, right? I, I'm sure that, that there was this sense of Jesus giving them some big hugs. I don't think they did high fives then, nor knuckles or any bumps or anything like that. But, but big hugs, kisses even, and uh, guys, I'm, I'm leaving. And so the first thing he says, but, but before I go, God bless you. I just, I just bless you. And then, and then what, what next? Then he leaves. <laughs> Just like that. In fact, Acts says that the guys are still standing there like watching up to heaven. I think all of us would be too, wouldn't we? If Jesus literally was standing here in our midst and we all went outside and suddenly we just watched him going up, what would we do? Well, that was interesting. <laughs> I mean, let me stand in there whoa, how did he do that? Oh, man, this is crazy. Look at him. Wow. Wouldn't you be a little, just a little bit excited? So he, he leaves them. And what does it say that they did? They worshiped him. They worshiped him. I don't know. They start singing. They just stand there. Wow, Jesus, you are God. You're amazing, God. Praise you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, oh, my goodness. I mean, what, what, would, what would you do if you're standing there and, you start see, see, and you're seeing Jesus going, to heaven, going up to heaven and you're just like, this is, this is just mind-boggling. This is amazing. You know, oh, God. It, it, it's, it's, it's Denny's, wow, God. Okay, right? I mean, you're gonna, we're going to worship him there, and that's what they did. And then it says, and I love this. It says, and they were full of joy. It doesn't sound like the guys 40 days earlier. 40 days earlier, they're in so much pain. They're crying. They're hurting. They're doubting. They're questioning. They're they is just broken guys. But now in just 40 days, hell, Jesus has just left. Only this time he's left, and they're like excited. What happened? And why are they excited that he's left? Because they've understood finally who he is. And so they've worshipped him. And then they publicly went back and started praising God. These are the guys who 40 days earlier were behind locked doors. 30 days earlier, there's still, lo they're still locked doors. In fact, this very day, Matthew says that some of them are standing there and still doubting. And yet now they're watching him just rise up right there above in front of their eyes. And they're filled with joy and they go back to the temple of all places the place that he was kicked out of, the place where he's accused of blasphemy, the place where he was rejected. There was a reason for his crucifixion. They go back to the temple and they're there praising God for what Jesus has done. These men are radically changed. Keith uh, Whitfield, uh, in, a, in a lesson called Four Reasons Jesus' Ascension Matters, said the ascension had a profound impact on the disciples. Up to the moment that Jesus ascended to heaven, the disciples seemed to be puzzled, trying to figure it all out. But after the ascension, they worshipped him. They traveled back to Jerusalem with great joy. They maintained a regular presence in the temple, worshipping God. <clears throat> Doesn't that kind of sound odd to you, though? When we um, left Florida to come back home, uh, there were uh, several tears <laughs> as uh, we were saying goodbye to the grandkids, goodbye to Jen and Phil. Um, there, was, there was a good amount of crying. Now, and we were thrilled. I mean, they have a house that's tremendous. You sell a house in California, you buy one in Florida, you get a lot bigger house. Okay. especially if you go from Orange County, which is where Jen and Phil were going from, you get a lot, lot more house. In fact, just to give you the, the, the clue, they sold a 900-square-foot condominium here in Orange County and bought a 3,300 or 3,500-square-foot home in Florida for the same price. Not too shabby. <laughs> okay. The, 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 there's other places where you can get a lot cheaper home. Now, Crestline, by the way, is not, well, that's another story. <clears throat> Uh, 
at, at first, wouldn't you expect it? I mean, I'm like really kind of caught uh, off guard by this. I kind of would expect even still, because they, they still don't totally get it. The Holy Spirit still hasn't filled them up. So um, there, there goes Jesus. Oh, no. Oh, we were enjoying this time with him. Oh, I mean, don't you think that, wouldn't you kind of expect them to be sad, to be crying, to be kind of like broken about this? I remember uh, when a um, couple, our, our youth minister and his wife decided they were going to go to Japan and be missionaries in Japan. And, and um, Rachel's father was at the time where we were blessing them. And, and I said, so I asked him, you know, you know aren't you going to miss them? He says, oh, but... I'm going to see him someday in heaven, even if I never see him again. I'm like, dude, you're going to, you should be missing them more. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't that be the, the yeah, he's, he's the father. His daughter's leaving, going clear around the globe. Who knows whether he'll ever see her again or not. And he did. And, and she was taking a new grandchild and all that kind of stuff. And yet he said, but, but see, I understand something. I understand that even if I never see them again here, I'm going to see them again in heaven. And, and he really had a sense of joy because of that, even though he was saying goodbye to his daughter. And I think that's where the disciples were. Even though Jesus is leaving, and they know things are going to be totally different, but this last 40 days has so dramatically influenced what they believe and what they think that they're now not sad, not grieving, not broken, not discouraged, not, not afraid, but instead they're excited, full of joy. They're celebrating, they're praising. Not because, thank goodness Jesus has left, but no, because Jesus is going to send the Holy Spirit and they're getting the clue of what that means. What did Jesus say? You need to now go. In fact, I'm ordering you. Get back to, Jerusalem, to, to Galilee. In fact, you're into, into Jerusalem, and you're supposed to pray. And while you're praying, I want you simply waiting because the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You are going to receive power from the Holy Spirit. Let, let's face it. Sometimes in Baptist circles, we've been a little bit afraid of that phrase. A amen. Anyone know that kind of background? <laughs> a little nervous, like, you know, oh, baptized in the Spirit, what does that mean? We even, you know, we sometimes have been a little bit nervous about the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and some of that, frankly, is because I think we're all afraid to be out of control. Some of you like to be in control, right? And we're a little bit afraid that if the Holy Spirit comes in and fills me up, baptizes me, anoints me in some kind of way, I might do something that I didn't have control over. Like in the early church, the very first time the Holy Spirit came, what did they? They spoke in tongues and everyone could understand in their own language. It was an incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And, and each time that God gave the gift of the Holy Spirit to some new group, like when the Gentiles got it, they also spoke in tongues. Well, oh no, well, if I allow the Holy Spirit to baptize me, what if I start speaking in a tongue and I don't have any control over it? What if I start doing something weird, you know, like barking like a dog, rolling in the aisle? Don't think Jesus is going to have you do that. Okay, I'm reminded of the two ladies who, who put mustard all over their body and drove around town because they t said God told them to do that. All they wore was the mustard. Glad I wasn't there. Okay. God's not going to ask you to do those kinds of weird types of things like that, okay? God's got, God's got a lot of better focus and purpose behind the anointing of his power. And what does he say? I'm going to baptize you with the Spirit so you can be my witnesses, my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the othermost part of the world. I'm going to baptize you with the Spirit so you can be a witness for me, so you can tell people you've seen Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Your life's been changed by Jesus Christ, and you're going to tell your story in Crestline, all the way to Blue Jay and Lake Arrowhead, and even off the mountain to who knows where, but wherever God sends you. You're going to be his witness. And God is going to empower you to be that witness. In fact, you don't even need to worry about what you're going to say. In fact, stop worrying about how you're going to tell the neighbor about Jesus. Just go start loving that neighbor. Befriending that neighbor. Caring about na that neighbor. And guess what? As that neighbor says, why are you weird? Okay? Why are you being friendly with me? Okay? Why are you doing that? We got in trouble at the coffee shop recently on a Sunday morning. Yep, we got a Yelp. We got a negative Yelp. Um, uh, we, we got accused of having Jesus coffee. 
And the, and, the, and, the, and the people were there for a latte, and they didn't get their latte. And all this, uh, all this lady behind the counter kept talking about was the Jesus coffee that she's giving out. And all. Now, frankly, I know the ladies behind the counter. I know that no one of them ever said anything like that, never even used the word Jesus. But it was interesting, the, the hostility. And then on top of it all, to top it all off, she said, and the Jesus coffee's no good. God is going to empower you to be his witnesses. I love what Alicia did. She sent a, a note back to the, to the person who put that bad Yelp. Thing. And, you know, Yelp is a bad thing. You know, once you get negatives, you never can get rid of them. Uh, well, so she sent a note back. You know, I'm sorry you had a bad experience. Um, but please, uh, we, we'd love to have you come back sometime during the week when we do our lattes and all. And I'd like to give you a complimentary latte. So what's she doing? She's trying to show love. And God will empower you to be your, his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most part of the world with the baptism, with anointing, with the filling of the Holy Spirit. Folks, we don't need to be afraid of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God comes upon every person who believes that Jesus Christ has died and rose from the dead. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. And that's the beauty of it. Notice he said, when Jesus was talking to the disciples, he said, I, I gotta go. I got to get out of here because I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And you will, you will understand because you know you've already seen the Spirit. And then notice that other phrase. And the Holy Spirit will be, future tense, after I leave, will be in you. When you sense the presence of God, what's causing that? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. When you feel the conviction of God... <laughs> What's causing that? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> when when you find yourself in a conversation, you say, "I don't even know how I was saying I wasn't." I, I came up with answers, and it really meant. And this person, like they really reacted and responded. What is that? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the young lady who was there a few months ago and, and, and was uh, really contemplating taking her own life. And, and I told you about this, and she sends a note back to the coffee shop. Thank you for, for your kindness because I was thinking about taking my own life, and I didn't because of what you shared with me. That's the Holy Spirit at work in somebody's life. Let's not be afraid of the Holy Spirit. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You'll receive power. You'll, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. You will be my witnesses. Uh, earlier we read Acts 1, and I just want to remind you of some things from Acts 1 when it says, wait for the gift my father promised which you've heard me speak about. Go back and wait. You, you don't have to force the Holy Spirit, okay? You don't have to pretend you've got the Holy Spirit. You don't have to put any kind of show on. Just wait for the Holy Spirit and he will speak through you. Verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. What's the power? Well, incidentally, didn't Jesus say that he, we would cast out demons, heal the sick, um, even be able to, now he didn't tell you to go do this, but even be able to pick up poisonous snakes and not be hurt by them? What was his point? If you're serving Jesus, this power of the Holy Spirit is going to protect and bless you and equip you to do whatever God calls you to do. He goes on, he says, we're supposed to wait for the Spirit. In fact, uh, right at the end of verse 11, it says, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. There's something else about the ascension we've got to catch, folks. And that is the ascension. Jesus is saying, I'm leaving. The angels remind them of this. I'm leaving. I'm going up like this. But guess what? I'm coming back someday. And I'm going to come back just like this, ascending, descending, I should say, from the heavens. And all of the world will know when Jesus comes back. Matthew 28, another um, description of the ascension. Verse 16, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, what did they do? They worshiped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You will become empowered to be his witnesses, to make disciples, to teach others about Jesus Christ. In fact, Whit Keith Whitfield says, we go forward with hope and joy because the king of the universe promises that he will never leave or forsake us. 
If we want to experience greater transformation and the joy of following Jesus on mission, we should build our confidence on the finished and sufficient work of Jesus Christ. The resurrection and ascension testify to the completion and the perfection of his work. In John 16, verse 5, Jesus was talking right there in that, that last night conversation, and he says, okay, guys, I've got to leave. Now, like I said, this is before he died, right? He says, but I, I've got to leave, and it's to your advantage that I go away. It's to your advantage that I go away. Now, most of us would not feel like it was to our advantage for Jesus to leave us, would we? <laughs> for someone that mattered that much to leave us. He says, but, but in fact, let me share some more comments from Whitfield. Whitfield says, when Jesus ascended and sat down in the Father's right hand, the Father verified the accomplishment of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and he confirmed the final payment for sin. When Jesus ascended, it was making a statement to the heavens as well as to the darkness that Jesus had won the victory. He had defeated sin by his death on the cross. When he ascended, also look what else starts. When Jesus goes up to heaven, he begins his intercessory work on our behalf. Where is Jesus right now? At the, in the throne room, interceding on our behalf. That's a really cool thing. We actually now have Jesus praying there for us. The third thing, when Jesus ascended, his eternal reign over all enemies began. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 3, 22. Now that he has gone into heaven, he is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and all powers subject to him. Jesus has defeated the darkness and Satan and the demons with his death and his ascension into heaven. And then finally, when Jesus ascended, that's when the church got power. Power to be witnesses to our community. Are you praying for Crestline? Or well, wherever you're from, guys? <laughs> are, are you praying for your neighbors, the community you're, you're from, the family, the people that matter to you? Are you praying for them? And are you trying to somehow express God's love to them? They may not always like it. They may reject you. They may complain about your Jesus coffee. But nevertheless, God will empower you to be a witness to your community. And this church needs to understand that we've got to start praying more and be more open to the Spirit Spirit of God witnessing through us, loving this community through us. That's why we're trying to do the coffee shop. That's why we do vacation Bible school, life groups. That's why we got to realize we're living in a world that desperately needs to know that Jesus loves them. And God will work through us if we'll allow him to. The ascension is a vital part of the redemption story, writes Steve Mathewson. If we simply collapse the ascension into the resurrection, we miss stunning benefits tied directly to Jesus being taken into heaven. If we just have him uh, rising from the dead, that's wonderful, but there's more than the resurrection. There's the ascension. He goes on, it's not enough to celebrate the risen Lord on one spring Sunday and then forget about what comes next. The ascension is crucial and it's life-changing and eternity-changing for us as believers. In fact, there's five things that Matthew sa Matthewson says that Jesus did in the ascension. Number one, he is, it, the ascension established Jesus as the reigning king over all power for all time. Jesus is greater than any other authority, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. Jesus, by his ascension, moves to that place of power. What did, you, what did Paul say? That the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Secondly, it gives us access to God's throne. We have the privilege, because we have a high priest in heaven, to enter the throne room of God himself because Jesus is there mediating on our behalf, inviting us to come into that place and to talk with him. We are invited to draw near to him. It provides us, thirdly, an advocate on earth whose presence is limitless. 
this is really cool. That, that battery that uh, Wayne has in his, in those batteries in your flashlight, Wayne, I'm sorry to tell you this, they're going to die. Okay? They're going to run out of energy and the light will stop working. The bulb itself may even burn out. Who knows? But the power of the Holy Spirit is limitless. It can't be restricted even by human touch or, or by loss of energy in a battery or switch turning it on or off. But the, we have power that goes on and on. And so notice how Jesus said it. How is Jesus leaving? Excuse me. The incarnate Jesus was limited by space and time. He couldn't be with each one of his followers at once. If he had stayed on earth, he couldn't have been here simultaneously for Peter in Rome and John on the island of Patmos. But the Holy Spirit can. His empowering presence is available to all Jesus' followers everywhere at the same time. Isn't that amazing? So wherever Gary's at, the Holy Spirit's there. Okay, so down in Yucaipa, the Holy Spirit's there down in Yucaipa. Okay, but, but okay, where's serenity? The Holy Spirit's out there with every one of you guys out there at, at Serenity House. Every single one of you. The Holy Spirit's out there. But, but what about Flora? Is he over in Cedar Pines Park and he's in the other parts of Crestline? Is, is he in the mobile home park down there? Is he with you? Oh, but Roxanne, is he with you up at there at the, at the San Bernardino Family Service Agency? Russ, is, is the Holy Spirit with you guys as you're going to see a doctor in Riverside waiting for the baby? I mean, the Holy Spirit is everywhere. What about when you headed up to Washington State for the funeral of your brother? Where is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit was ever, is with every single one of us. And this is what's even more crazy. He's not just with us. But every other believer all the way around the globe, the Holy Spirit is with every single one of them. Praise Jesus. Limitless power available if we we'll allow the Spirit to work in us. You see, fourthly, he said, it gives us the spoils of Christ's victory. We get to enjoy the fact that Christ has won the victory over sin and death, the grave, over despair and discouragement. Jesus has already won the victory, and because he ascended into heaven, we get to start to enjoy that victory now. And guess what? And what did it say? What did the two angels say? Um, the same way he left is the way he's coming back. And what it does is it prepares us for his return. The Holy Spirit, because Jesus has ascended, is now preparing us for one day when Jesus is coming again. <clears throat> well, pretty good advantages just because Jesus left. One of the last things that I want to point out to this morning is that we are supposed to be faithful because our high priest has ascended. Robert Deffenball said the ascension was the final incontestable evidence that Jesus Christ was the victory over Satan and his hosts. It is the measure of his victory, but also the measure of the power which has been bestowed upon his saints to carry out his work on earth until he returns. <laughs> Hebrews 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, right? Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Did you get tempted to sin this week? Will you be tempted again to sin this coming week? We have a high priest who is right there in heaven who has paid the price for that sin, the one you committed this past week and the ones you'll commit next week. He's paid the price for those sins so that he can forgive you of those sins and cleanse you from your unrighteousness. We have a high priest who has been so faithful to us that we now need to be faithful to him. So verse 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What did Jesus say? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again that you can be with me and that you will be where I am. 
I appreciate um, an article I found by Brian Tabb, academic dean of Bethlehem College and Seminary. And he says to us today, there's four implications of the ascension of Jesus Christ. The first implication is this. Remember, Jesus is presently reigning as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's reigning in heaven. And he continues to be actively engaged in this world. He didn't abandon us when he left. He sent his spirit to be with us to change this world. Secondly, we need to live boldly, confidently, even strategically <coughs> as servants of the king of heaven. God has given us a responsibility because he's now the king, because he has freed, because he has won the victory. Now we need to live for that king. Thirdly, are you, any of you in pain today? Anyone suffering, hurting? You know, we've, we've got some family that's going through some stuff, don't we? Kim Carnes. This pancreatic cancer that's killing him. May only have a couple of three more months to live. We don't know. Maybe it'll be a year. The Lord only knows those things, right? But we know that he's that the, the cancer is spread throughout his whole body. It's in the lymph nodes. I mean, it's just it's nasty, especially pancreatic cancer. Are they in pain? As they, um, Kim's already lost over a hundred pounds this last year. Um, as they're trying to say goodbye, literally goodbye to sons and daughters and grandchildren and friends. They recently took a short trip. He was hoping to go across the country and realized he couldn't do that. So he took a short trip, went up to Colorado. For what purpose? For the same purpose that Jesus met with his disciples that night to say, I love you, goodbye. I'm not going to see you again. For those of you who are suffering, the ascension says that Jesus is not deserting you in your struggle. That Jesus is with you. That Jesus cares about your heartache, your pain. And so he's promised that even when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, he will be with you. So whatever thing you're going through right now, whatever turmoil, whatever heartache, whatever difficulty, whatever challenge, the ascension says, Jesus is with you. You don't need to face it alone. And then finally, what's the last thing about the ascension? That we have hope in the future. Christ is coming again. He will return to both judge and to set up the new kingdom. To set us free from all evil. People ask, why doesn't God just end evil right now? And frankly, folks, there's one reason. And I'm convinced of it. That the reason Jesus doesn't come back and end all evil and just get rid of all the bad stuff is because when he does, it's a demarcation line. It's a day of judgment. And for those who believe, they will be with him in heaven forever. But for those who have said no, they will not have another opportunity. And Jesus waits to come back with a hope that one more will say yes to him. He loves us so much that he waits for one more. And so he's willing to allow evil to do evil things rather than ending it all because he's concerned about those that still stand on the other side of the line. And I guess I would just ask if you were there on that side of the line where you're saying, haven't really believed in Jesus. He ascended up in heaven. He has given you every evidence that he has risen from the dead, that he is who he said he was. Have you said yes to him? Because when you say yes, you'll know it. The Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit fills you up to overflowing. The Holy Spirit changes your life. God himself starts to dwell within you. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. I got to warn you about that one. 
Okay, that sometimes you come to Jesus and you're like, you know, you know more. You're, maybe you're even behaving worse than you did before. There's no perfection here. In fact, if you're looking for perfection in the church, you're never going to find it in this one because we're people that here are imperfect, just like the, your neighbor and just like you are. But if you want God to look at you as perfect because the price has been paid for you and you want God to fill you up with his love and be a part of your life, then I would simply invite you to say yes. Say yes to Jesus Christ. Father God. Wow, the ascension means a lot more today to me than I, than I realized even just a few weeks ago. It's incredible what you've done for us, the victory you've, you've purchased, the power available to us. You're, you're, you're interceding on our behalf in heaven. Oh God, there's so much that you're doing because you ascended back into the throne room. Thank you. Help us to be different, not afraid of the Holy Spirit filling us up again and again to overflowing, equipping and anointing us to be your witnesses. Help us to realize, God, that you hear our prayers, that you're listening to us right now. Holy Spirit, I pray your anointing for each person here in this room. May we have that same joy that can't be taken away, that carried the disciples through the worst of persecution all the way into heaven, that equipped and empowered them to be such powerful witnesses. Oh God, do the same thing in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Love me, love never fails and never gives.